Chapter six of the Afghan Wars, eighteen thirty nine to eighteen forty two and eighteen seventy eight to eighteen eighty. Part one The First Afghan War by Archibald Forbes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Six The Road to Ruin. As a result of the military disaster of November twenty third, and of the representations of the general recorded in the last chapter, Macnaughton with whatever reluctance, permitted himself to entertain proposals for an arrangement made by the Afghan leaders. From the beginning of the outbreak, while urging on the military authorities to exert themselves in putting down the revolt, he had been engaged in tortuous and dangerous intrigues with the object of sowing discord among the Afghan chiefs and thus weakening the league of hostility against Shah Sujah and his British supporters. In the conduct of these intrigues, he used the services of Mohan Lal, who had been one of Burns' assistants, and who, having escaped the fate of his chief, had found refuge in the city residence of a Kuzilbash chief. Mohan Lal was a fitting agent for the sort of work prescribed to him, and he burrowed and suborned with assiduity, and not altogether without success but it is unhappily true that he was commissioned to carry out a darker enterprise, the removal by assassination of certain of the more virulently hostile among the Afghan leaders. The incident is the blackest of the many discreditable transactions which chequer the inner political history of this melancholy chapter of our annals. It is unfortunately certain that Lieutenant John Connolly, Macnaughton's kinsman, and his confidential representative with Shah Sujah, authorised Mohan Lal, in writing, to compass the taking off of prominent Afghan leaders. In a letter to Mohan Lal of 5th November, Connolly wrote, quote, I promise 10,000 rupees for the head of each rebel chief. Unquote. Again on the 11th he wrote, quote, There is a man called Haji Ali, who might be induced by a bribe to try and bring in the heads of one or two of the Mufsids. Endeavour to let him know that 10,000 rupees will be given for each head, or even 15,000 rupees. Unquote. Two chiefs certainly did die under suspicious circumstances, and in each case the blood money was claimed. It was refused by Mohan Lal on the plea that the stipulation that the heads of the dead Afghans should be brought in was not fulfilled. Whether Macnaughton inspired these nefarious machinations, whether indeed he was actively aware of them, are questions which, in the absence of conclusive evidence, may judiciously be left unanswered. There is extant a letter from him to Mohan Lal, written December 1st, which has the following passage, quote, I am sorry to find from your letter of last night that you should have supposed it was ever my object to encourage assassination. The rebels are very wicked men, but we must not take unlawful means to destroy them." Unquote. And later he is reported to have informed an Afghan deputation that, quote, as a British functionary, nothing would induce him to pay a price for blood. Unquote. Durand holds that it was the belief on the part of the Afghan chiefs that the British envoy had set a price on their heads, which destroyed all confidence in Macnaughton's good faith, and which was Akbar Khan's chief incentive to his murder. The terms proffered on November 25th by an Afghan deputation were so humiliating that Macnaughton peremptorily rejected them, and the threat of immediate hostilities unless our people promptly surrendered their arms and withdrew was not carried out. A period of inaction strangely ensued, which on the Afghan side was a treacherous lull, but which Macnaughton, hoping against hope that some turn in our favour might yet occur, regarded with complacency. The chiefs, aware that winter was approaching with added hardship to the forlorn garrison, temporarily desisted from urging negotiations. But the British military authorities, with troops living from hand to mouth on precarious half-rations, and with transport cattle dying fast of starvation, kept urging the envoy to activity in making terms, if absolute starvation was to be averted. 
futile projects were discussed between envoy and general only to be put aside as the dreary days of inaction and depletion passed the deterioration of military spirit among our people manifested itself more and more plainly british soldiers stolidly watched the afghans destroying our bridge across the kabul river within a quarter of a mile from cantonments scared by the threat of an assault which in the scornful words of brave lady sale a child with a stick might have repulsed the garrison of the mohammed sharif fort abandoned it in a panic the white soldiers of the forty fourth showing the example of pusillanimity to the sepoys whom their cowardice demoralized next day the detachment of the forty fourth which had guarded an exposed position had to be withdrawn ceding the post of honour to the stauncher sepoys the camp followers were living on carrion the commissaries reported but four days provisions in store and their inability to procure any more supplies at length on december eighth the four senior military officers informed the envoy that it was imperatively necessary he should negotiate a retreat on the best terms he could obtain Macnaughton had to bring himself to recognize that the alternatives were negotiation or starvation, and on the 11th December, with a draft treaty in his hand, he met the principal Afghan chiefs on the riverside between the cantonments and the city. After the introductory palavers, Macnaughton read the proposed treaty, whose purport was as follows, that the British should evacuate Afghanistan forthwith unmolested, furnished with supplies and accompanied by hostages on their march to india that the dost his family and other afghan political exiles should be allowed to return to their country that shah sujah should have the option of remaining at kabul or going down to india that amnesty should be accorded to all adherents of shah sujah and his british allies that all prisoners should be released and that perpetual friendship and mutual good offices should thenceforth endure between the British and the Afghans. Akbar Khan made demur to some of the provisions, but was overruled, and the main stipulations of the treaty were agreed to by the chiefs. The conference broke up with the understanding that the British troops should evacuate cantonments within three days, and that meanwhile provisions should be sent in for their use. The treaty was simply a virtual capitulation all along the line, but the inherent falseness of our position, the incapacity of the military chiefs, and the debased spirit of the troops, consequent partly on low rations, but mainly because of the utter absence of competent and vigorous leadership, such as a Broadfoot or a Havelock would have supplied, enforced on the reluctant envoy conditions humiliating beyond previous parallel in the history of our nation. From the outset the Afghan chiefs defaulted from their promise of sending in supplies, but some grain was brought into cantonments by the troops, whose evacuation of the Bala Hissar on the 13th was effected under humiliating circumstances. The Afghans demanded the surrender of the forts in British occupation in the vicinity of the cantonments. The requisition was complied with, and the magazine fort furnished the enemy with both arms and ammunition. The three stipulated days passed away, and still the British force remained motionless in the cantonments. Macnaughton was bent on procrastination, and circumstances seemed to favour a policy which to all but himself was inexplicable. By the treaty, Shah Sujah was, in effect, committed to withdraw to India, but soon after its acceptance the chiefs had invited him to remain in Kabul as king on the stipulation that he should give his daughters in marriage to leaders of the malcontents. After considerable deliberation, the Shah had consented to remain on the condition named, but a few days later he withdrew his acceptance. His vacillation increased the suspicions of the chiefs, and they demanded the immediate evacuation of the cantonments, refusing to furnish provisions until that was done. Meanwhile, they sent in no transport animals, although large sums had been handed over for their purchase. Our people were still immobile, 
and already, on the 18th, there had occurred a fall of snow several inches deep. The envoy was engaged in strange and dubious intrigues, and since the Afghans were not fulfilling their share of the treaty obligations, he appears to have regarded himself as no longer bound by its conditions, and free to try to obtain better terms from other sources, in pursuit of which purpose he was expending money in a variety of directions. The dark and unscrupulous Mohan Lal was his confidant and instrument. Akbar Khan and the chiefs of his party had become aware of Macnaughton's machinations, and they laid a snare for him into which he fell with open eyes. Emissaries were sent to him with the sinister proposals that the British should remain in Afghanistan until the spring, when they were to withdraw as of their own accord, that the head of Amanullah Khan, one of the most powerful and obnoxious of the rebel leaders, should be presented to the envoy in return for a stipulated sum of money, and that for all those services the British government should requite Akbar Khan with a present of thirty lakhs of rupees, and an annual pension of four lakhs. Macnaughton refused peremptorily the proffer of Amanullah's head, but did not reject cooperation in that chief's capture by a dubious device in which British troops were to participate. He did not hesitate to accept the general terms of the proposals, and he consented to hold a conference with Akbar Khan on the following day to carry into effect the projected measures. On the morning of the 23rd, the deceived and doomed man, accompanied by his staff officers, Lawrence, Trevor, and Mackenzie, rode out from cantonments to keep the fateful tryst on the bank of the Kabul River. His manner was, quote, distracted and hurried, unquote. When he told Lawrence of the nature of the affair on which he was going, that shrewd officer immediately warned him that it was a plot against him. A plot, he replied hastily, let me alone for that, trust me for that. And Lawrence desisted from useless expostulation. Poor old Elphinstone had scented treachery, but the envoy had closed his mouth with the impatient words, quote, I understand these things better than you, unquote. As he rode out, he admitted the danger of the enterprise, but argued that if it succeeded, it was worth all risks. Quote, At all events, he ended, let the loss be what it may. I would rather die a hundred deaths than live the last six weeks over again. Unquote. The escort halted, and the four British gentlemen advanced to the place of rendezvous. Whither came presently Akbar Khan and his party. Akbar began the conference by asking the envoy if he was ready to carry out the proposals presented to him overnight. Why not, was Sir William's short reply. A number of Afghans, armed to the teeth, had gradually formed a circle around the informal durbar. Lawrence and Mackenzie pointed out this environment to some of the chiefs, who affected to drive off the intruders with their whips. But Akbar observed that it did not matter, as they were, quote, all in the secret. Suddenly, wrote Mackenzie, I heard Akbar call out, Begir, Begir! Seize, seize! And turning round, I saw him grasp the envoy's left hand with an expression on his face of the most diabolical ferocity. I think it was Sultan Jean who laid hold of the envoy's right hand. They dragged him in a stooping posture down the hillock, the only words I heard poor Sir William utter being, Asbari Kuda! For God's sake. I saw his face, however, and it was full of horror and astonishment. Unquote. Neither Mackenzie nor Lawrence, the surviving companions of the envoy, witnessed the actual end. Quote, whether, writes Kay, he died on the spot, or whether he was slain by the infuriated Ghazis, is not very clearly known. But the fanatics threw themselves on the prostrate body and hacked it with their knives. Unquote. There is no doubt that the head of the unfortunate Macnaughton was paraded in triumph through the streets of Kabul, and that the mangled trunk, after being dragged about the city, was hung up in the great bazaar. Of the three officers who accompanied the envoy to the conference, Trevor was massacred 
Lawrence and Mackenzie were saved with difficulty by friendly chiefs and brought into the city, where they and Captain Skinner joined the hostages, Captain Connolly and Airy, under the safe roof of the venerable Mahomed Zimun Khan. That Akbar and the Confederate chiefs spread a snare for the envoy is plain, and that they regarded his acceptance of their deceitful proposals as a proof of his faithlessness to the treaty obligations to which he had bound himself. It was no element in their reasoning that since they had not regarded the treaty the British functionary might, without breach of faith, hold that it did not bind him. But it is improbable that the murder of Macnaughton was actually included in their scheme of action. Their intention seems to have been to seize him as a hostage, with intent thus to secure the evacuation of Afghanistan and the restoration of Dost Mohammed. The ill-fated envoy's expressions on his way to the rendezvous indicate his unhinged state of mind. He went forth to sure treachery. Akbar's gust of sudden fury converted the planned abduction into savage murder, and his abrupt pistol bullet bulked the more wily and less ruthless project which had probably been devised in cold blood. The escort brought back into cantonments tidings that the envoy had been seized. The garrison got under arms and remained passive throughout the day. The defences were manned at night, in the apprehension that the noise and disturbance in the city portended an assault. But the clamour was caused by the mustering of the Afghans, in expectation that the British would attack the city, bent on vengeance on the murderers of the envoy. Action of that nature was, however, wholly absent from the prostrate minds of the military chiefs. On the following afternoon, Captain Lawrence transmitted certain overtures from the chiefs as the result of a conference held by them, when, notwithstanding severe comments on the conduct of the envoy, professions were made of sincere regret for his death. With certain alterations and additions, the treaty drawn up by Macnaughton was taken by the chiefs as the basis for the negotiations which they desired to renew. Major Pottinger, as now the senior political with the force, was called on by General Elphinstone to undertake the task of conducting negotiations with the Afghan leaders. The high-souled Pottinger rose at the summons from the sickbed to which he had been confined ever since his wonderful escape from Charakar, and accepted the thankless and distasteful duty. It is not necessary to recount the details of negotiations, every article and every stage of which display the arrogance of the men who knew themselves masters of the situation, and reveal not less the degrading humiliation to which was submitting itself a strong brigade of British troops whose arms were still in the soldiers' hands, and over whose ranks hung banners blazoned with victories that shall be memorable down the ages. On the sombre and cheerless Christmas day, Pottinger rose in the council of men who wore swords, and remonstrated with soldierly vigour and powerful argument against the degrading terms which the chiefs had contumeliously thrown to them. He produced letters from Jalalabad and Peshawar, giving information of reinforcements on the way from India, and urging the maintenance of resistance. He argued that to conclude a treaty with the Afghans would be a fatal error and suggested two alternative courses which offered a prospect of saving their honour and part of the army. The occupation of the Balahisar, which was the preferable measure, or the abandonment of camp, baggage and encumbrances, and forcing a retreat down the passes. The council, Pottinger must have written sarcastically when he termed it a council of war, unanimously decided that to remain in Kabul and to force a retreat were alike impracticable, and that nothing remained but the endeavour to release the army by agreeing to the conditions offered by the enemy. Quote, Under these circumstances, in the words of Pottinger, as the Major General coincided with the officers of the Council, and refused to attempt occupying the Balahisar, and as his second-in-command declared that impracticable, I considered it my duty notwithstanding my repugnance to and disapproval of the measure, to yield and attempt to carry on a negotiation." Unquote. This Pottinger accordingly did, 
The first demand with which he had to comply was to give bills for the great sums promised by the envoy to the chiefs for their services in furthering and supporting his treaty. This imposition had to be submitted to, since the Afghans stopped the supplies until the extortion was complied with. The next concession required was the surrender of the artillery of the force, with the exception of six field and three mule guns, and the military chiefs endured this humiliation, against which even the demoralized soldiery chafed. Then the demand for hostages had to be complied with, and four officers were sent on to join the two hostages already in Afghan hands. The chiefs had demanded four married hostages, with their wives and children, and a circular was sent round, offering to volunteers the inducement of a large stipend. But the sentiment of repulsion was too strong to be overcome by the bribe. The sick and wounded, who could not bear the march, were sent into the city in accordance with an article of the treaty, two surgeons accompanying their patients. The treaty, ratified by the leading chiefs and sent into cantonments on New Year's Day 1842, provided that the British troops, within twenty-four hours after receiving transport, and under the protection of certain chiefs and an adequate escort, should begin their march of evacuation, the Jalalabad garrison moving down to Peshawar in advance, that the six hostages left in Kabul should be well treated and liberated on the arrival at Peshawar of Dost Muhammad, the sick and wounded left behind to be at liberty to return to India on their recovery. All small arms and ordnance stores in the cantonment magazine to be made over to the Afghans, quote, as a token of friendship, unquote. On which account also they were to have all the British cannon, except as above mentioned. The Afghans to escort the Gunzi garrison in safety to Peshawar, and a further stipulation was that the British troops in Kandahar and western Afghanistan were to resign the territories occupied by them and start quickly for India, provisioned and protected from molestation by the way. Severe and humiliating as were these terms, they were not obtained without difficulty. The terms put forward in the earlier drafts of the treaty were yet more exacting, and the tone of the demands was abrupt, contemptuous and insulting. Pottinger had to plead, to entreat, to be abject, to beg the masterful Afghans, quote, not to overpower the weak with sufferings, to be good enough to excuse the women from the suffering of remaining as hostages, and to entreat them not to forget kindness, unquote, shown by us in former days. One blushes, not for but with the gallant Pottinger, loyally carrying out the miserable duty put upon him. The shame was not his, it lay on the council of superior officers who overruled his remonstrances, and ground his face into the dust. Our people were made to pass under the yoke every hour of their wretched lives during those last winter days in the Kabul cantonments. The fanatics and the common folk of the city and its environs swarmed around our petty ramparts with their foul sneers and their blackguard taunts, hurled with impunity from where they stood at the muzzles of the loaded guns which the gunners were forbidden to fire. Officers and rank and file were in a condition of smouldering fury, but no act of reprisal or retribution was permitted. If the present was one continuous misery, the future lowered yet more gloomily. It was of common knowledge as well in the cantonments as in the city that the engagements made by the chiefs were not worth the paper on which they had been written, and that treachery was being concerted against the force on its impending travail through the passes. It was told by a chief to one of the officers who was his friend that Akbar Khan had sworn to have in his possession the British ladies as security for the safe restoration of his own family and relatives, and, strange forecast to be fulfilled almost to the very letter, had vowed to annihilate every soldier of the British army, with the exception of one man, who should reach Jalalabad to tell the story of the massacre of all his comrades. Pottinger was well aware how desperate was the situation of the hapless people on whose behalf he had bent so low his proud soul. 
Mohan Lal warned him of the treachery the chiefs were plotting, and assured him that unless their son should accompany the army as hostages, it would be attacked on the march. Day after day the departure was delayed, on the pretext that the chiefs had not completed their preparations for the safe conduct of the force and its encumbrances. Day after day the snow was falling with a quiet, ruthless persistency. The bitter night frosts were destroying the sepoys and the camp followers, their vitality weakened by semi-starvation and by the lack of firewood which had long distressed them. At length, on January 5th, Sturt, the engineer officer, got his instructions to throw down into the ditch a section of the eastern rampart and so furnish a freer exit than the gates could afford. The supply of transport was inadequate, provisions were scant, and the escort promised by the chiefs was not forthcoming. Pottinger advised waiting yet a little longer until supplies and escort should arrive, but for once the military chiefs were set against the policy of delay, and firm orders were issued that the cantonment should be evacuated on the following day. Shah Suja remained in Kabul. The resolution became him better than anything else we know of the unfortunate man. It may be he reasoned that he had a chance for life by remaining in the Balahisar, and that, from what he knew, there was no chance of life for anyone participating in the fateful march. He behaved fairly by the British authorities, sending more than one solemn warning pressing on them the occupation of the Balahisar. And there was some dignity in his appeal to Brigadier Anquetil, who commanded his own contingent, quote, If it were well to forsake him in the hour of need, and to deprive him of the aid of that force which he had hitherto been taught to regard as his own? Unquote. End of chapter 6